okay, I got good news, bad news, and more bad news. So the good news is uh, the last time the Devils erased a 3-1 deficit, you would have to go back to the memorable 2000 Eastern Conference Finals versus the Philadelphia Flyers in which the Devils started the series on the road. And once again, they overcame the 3-1 deficit. The bad news is for NHL history, teams combined for an all-time series record of 32 and 302 when trailing 3-1 in a series. And the more bad news is that the New Jersey Devils have not played a single good game against the Carolina Hurricanes in this series. We have a lot to talk about in today's episode of Locked on Devils, and I got some behind-the-scenes uh, sound bites to share with you guys. So I guess that's good news in a sense. Buckle up, everybody. Your Locked on Devils, your daily podcast on the New Jersey Devils, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi, this is Bryce Salvador, and you're Locked on Devils with Trey Matthews. All righty now, what is up, New Jersey? Welcome back to the Locked On Devils podcast here on the Locked On Network. I'm your host, college hockey play-by-play announcer, Devils writer for Pucks and Pitchforks, and also part-time credentialed MIA member, Trey Matthews. Just got back from the Prudential Center, covering the game from the press box, and that was probably the New Jersey Devils' worst loss of the season. The scoreboard doesn't even do it justice. You could just tell midway through period number two, that the New Jersey Devils just had no life in them. They had no effort whatsoever. And that's what makes it so bad, which was the Devils just gave up on themselves before the final horn sounded. And it's not really a good recipe for success, especially when you have another period to play. I don't even know where to begin because there are so many unfortunate storylines that we have to discuss. We have to talk about Vitek Vancek. We got to talk about the defensive effort for the Devils. We also got to talk about how the Devils have not been handling the puck. And once again, it's just wash, rinse, repeat with this team during the course of the series because in games one and two, we see the Devils get off to a decent start, but they just completely implode at one point of the game and that is the final nail in the coffin before the start of the final period of regulation. And I was able to get a couple sound bites from Nico Heischer, Damon Severson, and Dougie Hamilton. So you're going to hear their thoughts throughout the course of the episode. But let's begin with the biggest storyline, which is VTech Banachek and Lindy Ruff's decision to start him in the first place. So what happened? Well, let's provide a bit of a backstory because. If you guys recall in the previous episode, what did I talk about that overall win for the Devils? Yes, it was exciting. Yes, there was a lot on the line. And yes, the Hughes brothers certainly did show out and they sent shockwaves throughout the NHL world and they were making headlines. That was great and all, but I said, don't overlook the fact that Vitek Vanacek did not look good in between the pipes. But fortunately for him, he got a lot of goal support. Now, I don't want to crap on Vitek Vanacek. He's a great guy, and during his post-game press conference, he had his head down. He looked really down on himself, and his teammates had his back. Nico Heischer said that the Devils didn't perform well in front of him, and also Damon Severson said that Vitek is going to bounce back. So Vitek Vanacek, the happy-go-lucky, lovable, fan-favorite player, was really down on himself post-game, and I've never seen him like that in any which sort of way. Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever seen a player that down of all my times going into the locker room to speak with the Devils players. So that really speaks volume to Vitek Vancek's character. And it's not really entirely on him. I blame it more on Lindy Ruff. So going back to my overall point, Vanacek, yes, he did get the win, but it wasn't in the same circumstance as Akira Schmidt's Game 3 win in the previous series against the New York Rangers because Like I said, Vitek Vanacek was just blessed that the New Jersey Devils just caught lightning in a bottle and their offense was on a new level because the Devils were able to put up eight goals. However, the Devils allowed four goals and three of them were shorthanded goals. And Vitek Vanacek, he just looked a little lost in the previous game. So it raised the overall question, who do you start in between the pipes for this game? I believe I mentioned it in the previous episode. I said, 
you have to put in Akira Schmidt because Schmidt is the only consistent goalie that's racking up the wins for the Devils during the playoffs because Vitek Vanacek, no disrespect to him because he had a great regular season, but in the playoffs, he's completely crashed and burned. And like I said, this isn't entirely on Vitek Vanacek because he's only doing what Lindy Ruff is telling him to do. And speaking of which, Lindy Ruff in his post-game press conference was not a happy camper, obviously, because like I said, this was probably the worst loss of the season for the New Jersey Devils. Now, there's another storyline that we need to discuss involving VTech Banachek, which was Lindy Ruff's uh, decision to pull him from the game a little too late. So what had happened? Well, the New Jersey Devils called a timeout when they were down four to one and people anticipated for Akira Schmidt to come in relief for VTech Banachek, because like I said, it's period number two. It's almost halfway done and the Devils are trailing four to one. That should be a reasonable time to pull Vanacek from the game because it's not only this game alone, but it's also his lackluster performance in game three, but it's under the rug because the Devils came out with the win. So Lindy Ruff should see that Vanacek just doesn't have it. He just doesn't have it during the course of the playoffs. He didn't have it in this game. And yes, I know he got the win, but like I said, he was just blessed with some good circumstance. But no, Lindy Ruff kept him in the game. And then what happened a few moments later? Well, Brett Burns was able to score, make it 5-1, to one, and the possibility of the New Jersey Devils making a miraculous comeback out the door. So going back to Lindy Ruff, he was very grouchy in his post-game press conference, and rightfully so. I didn't get the chance to ask him a question. I did have the microphone in my hands, but he stormed off the podium before I had the chance to open my mouth and ask a question. Luckily, I have some good associates who were able to ask him the hard-hitting questions. So Ryan Novozinski, who's a beat reporter for NJ.com, he asked the tough question, which was, why didn't you pull Vitek Vanacek when you were down four to one and what was the thought process going into that now Lindy Ruff like I said he was a little snippy and he said it wasn't on the goaltending it was the execution in front of him now here's the thing for Lindy Ruff Ruff doesn't really put blame on his goalies too often because I remember asking him a similar question when the Devils came down to Arizona and as you guys recall that game went into OT and VTAC Banchek wasn't really sharpened between the pipes and Going back a few games prior to that Arizona Coyotes game, he was actually pulled from a game relatively early against the Colorado Avalanche. So Vitek Vanacek during that time span just wasn't looking that good. And I asked Lindy Ruff postgame, is it time to be concerned with the execution of your goalies? And he said, it's not really on the goalies. It's on the players in front of them. So I respect that Lindy Ruff, whether it's Vitek Vanacek, Akira Schmidt, or Mackenzie Blackwood, He never throws his netminders under the bus, but this was the correct question that Ryan Ovazinski asked, and I'm going to defend him in that case because Lindy Ruff should have pulled uh, uh, Vitek Vanacek from the game when the Devils went down 4-1. to No ands, ifs, or buts about it because you obviously see it's not working, and even then, if you don't think it's entirely on Vitek Vanacek, which it's not, then uh, at least try to use it as some sort of momentum shift for your team because that's sometimes what you do with a goalie swap. So it didn't make much sense to leave Vitek Vanacek out there. And I I respect, like I said, that Lindy Ruff doesn't like to throw his goalies underneath the bus, but the facts are there. During the course of the playoffs, he has appeared in seven games. He has a record of one and three. He has a goals against average of 4.64 and a save percentage of 825. And James Nichols, who was sitting just a few seats down from me at the press box, he even added to that saying that after this outing, Vanacek's goal scored above expected total is now minus 7.69, which is dead last of all goaltenders in the playoffs. So once again, Big Tech Vanacek just didn't have it in this game, and he hasn't had it throughout the course of the playoffs. Akira Schmidt should have started for the Devils, but it's not entirely on Vitek Vanchuk because the execution in front of them was also lackluster. So when looking at some of the other statistics that needs to be brought into the light, Luke Hughes and Dougie Hamilton's plus minus dead last amongst the Devils uh, in this game, minus three. And the giveaways. I know I compare stats towards the end of game recap episodes, but this just needs to be talked about. The Devils had 26 giveaways 
compared to the Carolina Hurricanes is two. That is unacceptable. You got to handle the puck. So once again, BTEC Vanacek, not good in between the pipes. The defense was lackluster. The offense execution got off to a decent start, but they couldn't maintain it throughout the course of the game. So that's my little bit of a tangent. So my my overall feeling about VTech Vancheck was that he had no business starting this game, and Lindy Ruff made a mistake not once but twice. He shouldn't have been starting, and you should have pulled them when you called the timeout. And why he didn't do it, 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 it just baffles me because, once again, Devils were down 4-1, to one, and you just exonerated any chance of a miraculous comeback by allowing Brett Burns to score once more to make it 5-1, to one, and then you decide to bring in Akira Schmidt. His confidence is already shaken up. I saw it post-game. His head was down. He couldn't look the reporters into the eyes. And poor Vitek Vancek, I'm sure, it, it, I, like I said, it's not intentional. He's a fan favorite for a reason, and he's a great guy. But that was not the right call from Lindy Ruff. And some of my avid listeners will tell you, I am one of Lindy Ruff's biggest defenders, but I can't defend him in this case. Now, I had the chance once again to get some behind the scenes sound bites. So I asked Dougie Hamilton, what does the defense need to do in order to uh, come away victorious in now an elimination game for the Devils? He was very vague. You could tell that he did not want to talk to the media, but here was his response post game. What are some of the uh, defensive changes that you guys need to make in order to uh, come away with uh, better outcomes, especially now that you guys are facing elimination? Yeah, I mean, we'll figure it out tomorrow. Obviously, uh, not good enough tonight, and we'll figure out tomorrow what we have to do and um, get better for next game. And now this is going to lead into the next segment in which I talk about the game in general, and you're also going to hear some more sound bites from Nico Heischer and Damon Severson. But before we continue with today's episode, let me tell you about Indeed, because unlike the New Jersey Devils, you need to find the winning team. So Indeed is a hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills. Indeed's powerful hiring platform can help you do it all. So with Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor, according to Indeed data. US. So once again, everyone likes winning. Everyone likes making money. So you need Indeed. So start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash locked on. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash locked on. Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Okay, so let's talk about this game in general, for the Devils. What went wrong specifically aside from a lackluster performance from VTEC Vanacek? So here's what I saw in period number one. The Devils got off to a pretty decent start. So whatever the Carolina Hurricanes were throwing at them, the Devils had some sort of answer. And the, the proof is in the pudding because the Devils were able to score the first goal of the game. Once again, I think that's the only positive takeaway that I can get from this outing from the Devils because Timo Meyer and Jack Hughes once again prove why they are so effective together because early on in period number one, Timo Meyer was able to get a quick shot off. I thought he was going to be credited with the goal. He was the first one in the high five line, but they later credited it to Jack Hughes because Jack Hughes was standing in front of the net and I guess it grazed his his uh, pads just a little bit. So Jack Hughes was credited with the goal. So in this case, the roles were flipped because Timo Meyer is now trying to maneuver the puck deep into the offensive end. And Jack Hughes is in front trying to uh, redirect the puck on in. So that I guess it could work both ways. But like I said, that was pretty much the only positive takeaway that I could get from this overall outing for the Devils. So it was a good start to period number one for the Devils. But as it progressed... You just saw that the Carolina Hurricanes were starting to regain their momentum. They had more grit. They had more effort. They had more determination. And and it was just another example in which whatever the Devils could do, the Carolina Hurricanes could just do 10 times better. And something that just bothered me was that the first goal of the game that was led up by the the, the Devils was, uh, quite honestly, a lucky shot from Natchez because it took one bounce in front of Natchez. Martinook was able to set him up. And I don't know how many of you are basketball fans, but 
If you see an alley open basketball, I think that's sort of what it would be like in hockey because Martinuk just was able to bounce the puck right in front of Natchez, just took one hop, and Natchez was able to swing at it. And Vitek Banchek, he was gearing up for it to just be a second or two late. And then Natchez was just able to find it past Vanacek. So once again, that was just a lucky hop in front of Natchez to tie it up. Natchez scored twice in this game, but Nonetheless, the Devils were able to just uh, weather the storm in period number one, even though Eric Halla did get a penalty late in the period. He got a delay of game call. So to start period number two, the Carolina Hurricanes were on the man advantage. But at the end of period one, I just saw that the Devils, once again, they got off to a good start. But the end of it, they allowed the Carolina Hurricanes to recapture that momentum. And like I said early on in the episode, it's just wash rinse and repeat for this team because it's another example in which the devils put up a decent battle early but they cannot maintain it and i know james nichols usually does this but i tweeted out the deserve to win o meter after period number one because i was curious how was this game going into the favor of the devils and it was actually split dead even 50 percent so the deserved to win meter was saying that the Carolina Hurricanes, after so-and-so simulations, had a 50% chance to win after period number one, and the Devils were the same way. So uh, I guess my theory is correct, which is Devils got off to a good start. They were the better team, but not for long as the Carolina Hurricanes were able to answer on back. Now, we all know what happened in period number two. The Devils completely imploded, and in the words of Nico Heischer, they just stopped playing because you could just see in the body language for the Devils that they just knew that they weren't going to win the game. And that's not a recipe for success, like I said early on in the episode. But I'm sure you don't want to just hear my reactions. Here's what Damon Severson told me post game when I asked him, like, what does the team need to work on in order to try to get better? Because now they're facing an elimination game and they have limited time to clean up their mistakes. What are some of the adjustments you would like to see be made uh, in order for you guys to keep your season alive in Raleigh? Obviously, we need our special teams to be better. Uh, our power play's got to, you know, step up, um, and then just pucks, pucks that we got to get on net. We got to get some second chances, and um, we we put up eight goals last game, and you know we got the offense. Now it's just a matter of making sure we're sharp in the defensive zone, and then when we do get the offense, we sustain it because they're very good at getting pucks and just getting out of the zone as quick as possible. So um, if we're going to want to sustain offense, we got to keep the pucks down there and protect them. And when we get shots, recover them. Severson's absolutely right. Special teams need to improve because every time the Devils went on the power play or they only went on the power play twice, I just knew they weren't going to score. Just the, the execution is not there. And we saw it in game three, which was the Devils gave up three shorthanded goals. I, I Like I said in the previous episode, I give them the benefit of the doubt because Martin Oaks shouldn't have been given a penalty shot, but special teams does need to improve. And he's talking about second chances. The Devils need to give themselves a first chance because in period number two, the Devils just had a tough time setting up shop. Like their passing was good in period number one, but towards the end of period number one, their passing was all over the place. It was like they lost communication with one another and it carried over into period number two because once again, like I just said, the Devils could not set up shop in their offensive end. The Carolina Hurricanes were able to bully and just maneuver the puck away from them. And every time the Devils did have possession of the puck in their offensive end, you just knew they weren't going to score because no one had a clean look. So I agree with Damon Severson. you got to make sure you give yourself multiple chances and it can't be a one and done opportunity. But before you create those second chances, you got to create those first chances because if you have no chance in the first place, then you're, you're not going to score any goals. And then the offense, like I said, it seems like the offense is sometimes there, sometimes it's not. But uh, if game three was any indicator, the Devils are capable of scoring a lot of goals. But you got to stop some goals in order to uh, have that sort of chance of winning the game. Now, I asked the captain, Nico Heischer, what do what does the team need to work on and what did they need to do in order to clean it up in front of whichever net minder is out there for them? And here's what he said. You talked about mistakes. Uh, what what things would you like to see done differently from your team? We've got to be more skating, got to support the puck more. And uh, we've got to be stronger in front of the net. And uh, they won again tonight. They won again uh, more battles than us. So once again, Prior to me asking a question, Nico Heischer said that the team just basically stopped playing. They stopped skating. And 
you could just see it in their body language. And he's absolutely right. I couldn't have said it any better myself. The Devils just got out battled. And it's just frustrating to see because Nico Kiescher said a couple games ago that the Devils should be playing pissed off. It's the playoffs, but I didn't see them play pissed off. I saw them pouting and just basically gave up because it's hard to make a five to one comeback, especially when the period, uh, the middle period of play is halfway done. So Nico Heischer and Damon Severson are absolutely correct with everything they said. So special teams needs to improve. Uh, second chances, you, in order to get those second chances in the first place, you got to create some first chances for yourself. The offense is sometimes there, sometimes it's not. But I have more faith in the offense than I do with the defense. And, yeah, that's what I saw in this game because the, the Devils just once again, how do you just make sure you don't just have a spurt of momentum, you have a spurt of urgency you got to make sure you maintain it throughout the entire 60 because, once again, in game three, you just knew that the Devils' offense was there because they scored eight goals, but it doesn't matter because they let up a lot of goals. And it carried over into this game, and that's what I was concerned about because the Devils have not played a good game at all in this series, and now they're on the brink of elimination. They trail three to one. So their backs are against the wall. I Like I said, I try not to doubt the Devils in this case, but – they haven't shown me any signs of possibly upsetting this Carolina Hurricanes team. And if you're curious, according to Ryan Novozinski, the Devils have a 1-10 overall record when trailing best of seven series three games to one. So if, if you're not good at math like me, that's a 0.91% chance of the Devils overcoming a 3-1 lead and winning this series. So we said that the Devils are the never-say-die kids. Well, here's your chance to show it. Shock the world once again. So we've seen the Devils overcome a, a 2 nothing deficit, but now they're down 3-1. Can they be like the Florida Panthers and, and have the Carolina Hurricanes blow the most infamous lead in hockey? Well, none of these games have been good for the Devils like I alluded to, so only time will tell. Okay, so reluctantly, like I do with every post-game recap, let's look at the stats, and then I'll give the Devils a letter grade. But before we do so, I had the chance, once again, to speak with Damon Severson and Nico Heischer. So here's what Damon Severson said when I asked him, like, look, you're one of the longest-tenured Devils players on the roster alongside with Miles Wood and Mackenzie Blackwood. What are you telling the guys in, or in order to rally up the troops? Because whatever you want to think about Damon Severson – he still deserves the, the credit of being a veteran leader because he's seen things in this organization that a lot of people haven't because, once again, he's one of the longest tenured players on the roster. Here was his answer. Being one of the longest tenured uh, players on the roster, what are you telling the team to try to rally them up now that you guys are facing elimination? Uh, just be confident. Um, we trust ourselves. We trust who's in this dressing room and, and the players. And there's really nothing, no secret to success at this point. We we saw what we did in game three to make ourselves successful. And um, now it's just a matter of, you know, giving it all we got because we don't have a choice anymore. We want this thing to keep going and we want to keep con continue to play with each other because we had such a successful season. And we did in the regular season. Now we just have to continue to ramp up our game and, and match their intensity. Match intensity. That's literally what I said in the previous segment. You can't just show spurts of it. You got to show it in the first period, the second period, and the third period because obviously the Carolina Hurricanes are going to try to bully their way to the next round of the playoffs. And right now, you are on death's door. So you're down 3-1. You got to try to do whatever it takes. And here's what Nico Heischer had to say when I asked him the similar question. As the captain of the team, what are some of the things you're telling the guys? Because it's been very evident this season that you guys know how to bounce back from adversity. I know this isn't the ideal circumstance, but you still got one more game to play with uh, facing elimination. That it's not done. Um, if, you're not, if you're not believing, uh, you, you gotta stay here and uh, not come to Carolina. So uh, gotta keep our heads high. and. Uh, now we just know we can't make uh, those mistakes again. And, but uh, that's what I'm telling these guys. We've got to believe. If not, you already lost. I applaud Nico's leadership. And like he said, if you don't believe that the Devils can win, then I guess don't go to Raleigh. Well, I'll just say from my perspective up in the press box or the fans' perspective, the reporters' uh, perspective, the Devils have not impressed me in this series at all, quite honestly. And 
we might have to see a Mackenzie Blackwood signing. I know I jokingly said on Twitter saying that his days as a devil are over, but Kier Schmidt, he hasn't done well in this series. Vitek Vancek has certainly not done well in this series. Lindy Ruff might have no choice but to scratch Vitek Vancek and possibly give Mackenzie Blackwood a chance. Yes, we're having that discussion, and maybe, just maybe, I'll talk about it in the next episode. But reluctantly, guys, let's compare the stats, and I'll give the Devils a letter grade. So shots on goal category, 29-22 to 22 in favor of the Hurricanes. Face-off percentage, 41% to 59% in favor of the Devils. Hurricanes were over 3 on the power play, so at least the Devils' penalty kill was good. And there, there's a positive takeaway. Devils were 0 for 2. Hits 32 to 30 in favor of the Devils. Blocks 16 to 9 in favor of the Devils. Giveaways. I talked about this earlier, but it still pains me to say it. 26 to 2 in favor of the Devils. Unacceptable. Um, there's really no positive takeaways that I can get from this game because defense execution was bad, goaltending execution was bad. I question Lindy Ruff's uh, decision-making during the course of the game. And the offense, aside from that Jack Hughes goal, nothing really to get excited for. So I think you guys know what I'm going to give the Devils. I'm going to give them an F because at least the, the, the one thing I could say, at least in game one, I could just say it's game one. Maybe the Devils were a little fatigued. Maybe they were a little f- tired and the referees didn't really give them the benefit of the doubt. Game two, I could say, hey, they improved this, but it still ended in a blowout. Game three, I said, okay, Devils offense came to play. They're giving themselves a fighting chance. They took complete steps backwards. It was like they took two steps forward, but took three steps backwards. So I have to give them an F because they didn't increase. They decreased at the wrong possible time. But the one advice I could give the Devils and the one hope I can can just say for this overall unit is that the Devils are the never-say-die kids. And, and usually they perform better with their backs against the wall. They're a good road team. Um, and, and the one advice I could give them is like, look, you got to come back to New Jersey either way. You're either going to come back to New Jersey gearing up for game six or your season's going to be over and you're going to be getting ready for the exit meeting interviews and I'm going to be getting ready for silly season and off-season content discussion. So, like I said, in the cold open, it's not really looking good for the Devils. Uh, the numbers aren't on their side. But then again, the numbers weren't on their side in the first series against the Rangers. So, I don't want to doubt them, but it's not looking all that good. I do have my doubts a little bit, but we'll see what happens. So, let me know what you guys think and let me know what you guys thought of the sound bites from Damon Severson and also Nico Heischer. Dougie Hamilton wasn't really much of a talker, and understandably so. But, yeah, curious to hear your guys' thoughts, so leave a comment down below. Did you think Vitek Vancek was at fault for the loss for the Devils? Because I do agree with Lindy Ruff in some sort of sense, which is I don't think it's one player in particular as to why a team loses. It's a collective team effort, and the Devils, like I said, nothing good offensively, nothing good defensively, and goaltending is obviously the one thing that we look at in blowouts. But at the same time, It's not like the Devils played elite in front of uh, VTech Vancek. So that's all I got to say in that regard. So leave a comment down below. Curious to hear you guys' thoughts. And uh, hit me up on my personal tour pitch at TreyMat4 or the show's tour pitch at Locked on Devils. As for today's episode, that's all the time I have for you. So continue to stay safe. Have a wonderful day, New Jersey. Go Devils. I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Thanks for listening once again.